G'day guys and welcome back today to another video on the Druzy channel. We're back for nine things we've learned from round three. I'm sorry there was no episode last week. I've just moved to Melbourne and I had food poisoning. There was a lot going on in this last seven days, but I am back and the content will be back and better than ever. I've made the move, so it's time to get amongst it. So let's get into the nine things that we learned from round three. Number one, not many of you are subscribed. More than 60% of the people that watch the Druzy channel aren't subscribed, and that hurts my soul. I'm trying to hit 10K as soon as I possibly can. So if you're one of these dirty pigs that isn't subscribed to the Druzy channel, make sure you hop on board to support the channel. It would help immeasurably. Leave a like on the video, and let's get into the actual things that we learned from round three. Number two. The Pies' pressure is their pillar of success. The Pies' win on Thursday night was as a result of the pressure that they brought for four quarters. The pressure that they were so famous for in 2023 is back. I think their skills are still looking sloppy. I can't remember a time in my life where Scott Pendlebury was going at 62% disposal efficiency. It's very uncharacteristic, but skills will come as the system gets back doing what it does. And I think this system's oil is is oiled on pressure, if that makes sense. Get the pressure right, turn the ball over high up the field, and it will give you a great chance to score. If they can bring that pressure again, the rest of their game will be built off that. So the Pies, they're back. The Lions, they're 0-3. They're having a stinker. But it wouldn't surprise me if the Pies become a real tough side again very soon. Number three, North still suck in 2024 and will for a long time. I feel like coming into this season, a lot of people thought, you know, North can't get any worse. They've been shit for three to four to five to six however many years, but they look like they've honestly taken a backward step. And it makes sense when you think of all the experience that they lost last year. I know it wasn't the best experience, but just having the maturity around the club would definitely help. And you look at North's probably best eight players, and they've probably all been drafted in the last three years. Their defensive stocks are absolutely depleted. Kerno and Harry Mackay just had a field day, just took the absolute piss. And they just don't look connected as a group. I went and watched Freo play North last week, and the match day experience is just sour. It's just, it's a sad club, North Melbourne, unfortunately. And I don't have anything against the Roos, but it's going to take a long time to get this club to where it needs to be. Probably another three or four drafts, to be honest, before I could see North even contending for the top eight. So lots of people had North climbing. I didn't, and they're going to suck all year long. It's going to be a tough year for North with their defenders that they have down back. They just, they're just they going to struggle to compete every single week. Number four, three -o. The Freo Dockers, a side that lots of people wrote off in 2024, are now 3-0. Now, I know it wasn't the cleanest game against the Adelaide Crows, and the Crows are struggling, but to keep a team to four goals in the AFL is commendable. Our defense was rock solid all day. Alex Pierce is probably having a career best year. Let's hope he can stay fit because he is looking like one of the best lockdown defenders in the league at the moment. And the others down back, Luke Ryan, Jordy Clark, James H, Josh Draper, the new boy. He looks composed on the ball. He looks silky. He looks like Michael Johnson, the old 37. So we defended well all day. We brought the pressure. We're tackling hard and we got the job done. Eventually, we ran over the top of the Crows and I think Frio's endurance to play four quarters is one of our best attributes. Frio had a massive off season. It was noted that they did a lot more running and a lot more physical stuff in the gym to be a tougher side for four quarters and now it's paying dividends. We head into gather round with this game coming up against Carlton. Both teams going into it undefeated and I hope that our pressure can overrun the Blues. It's going to be a tough game. I think it's going to go right down to the wire this one at gather round but the boys are in the best position possible to win it. Early days but it's a perfect start to the season for Frio. Number five. Stringer drags the Dons to victory. On the weekend, we saw one of Jake Stringer's six performances that he'll put out for the year where he absolutely turns it on. And it wasn't the nicest game of football to watch, but it was good to see Essendon when they faced adversity. They bounced back. They came together as a team and made it tough for St. Kilda to score because in the first sort of quarter and a half, it looked like the Saints could have just ran all over him and run away with the game. But they didn't take their chances, which allowed Essendon to come back into it. But in the fourth quarter, it was the package that stood up and rose to the occasions, putting the Dons on his back to win the game. Two fourth quarter goals, a massive shot from outside 50 on a tough angle. That's why he gets the fans up and about. That's why the Essendon faithful love him. This is what Essendon need Jake Stringer to do every week. Lead by example. Show the league that you are the star that you are and just put it together because that is exactly what Essendon need right now. And he single-handedly arguably gave them the four points against the Saints. Number six. 
How did Port Adelaide lose that? They were plus 21 inside 50s, and pretty much for three quarters, the game was played in Port Adelaide's front half. It was an interesting stylistic matchup. You could see that Port had extra numbers around the stoppages and around the contest, which made it a tough day at the office for Jack Viney, Clayton Oliver, Petrarca, and Sparrow. But the Ds had the numbers behind the ball, and they, they struggled to move the ball quick, because every time they got the ball, they were pretty much... 15 to 20 meters outside of their own goal and going long Asava Radagalia, Alia Alia they were just having a field day taking intercept mark after intercept mark and getting repeat entries but the D's just absorbed all of that pressure from Port Adelaide and late in the third quarter they got a few goals that were low percentage kicks and they just made it work Alex Neil Bullen absolutely played it out of his skin he got the three votes for me doing all the pressure acts, kicking important goals at important times in the game. He was everywhere. Ben Brown kicked one from about 55, and then they get two free kicks with about 20 seconds left for Max Gorn to have a shot on the three-quarter time siren. Just everything needed to go right for the Ds to get back in this contest after the domination that Port had. And I don't think the umpires were really bad all day. They just missed calls at really important times. There was a couple throws and a holding the ball that led to Tom Sparrow's goal, I think it was. But at the same time, Connor Rosie had a free kick right in front of goal that he shouldn't have. So I think that sort of cancels it out. It was a frustrating one to lose for Port fans. So I think they sort of just pointed the fingers at the umpire. But honestly, I don't think Port Adelaide really did anything wrong. Maybe sometimes they lacked discipline. Nine times out of ten, Port Adelaide win that. It was an absolutely gutsy, tough, and dig deep win for the Ds. I don't know how they won it, but they did, and that's a massive four points. Number seven, West Coast can't stop momentum. West Coast actually looked decent for a quarter and a half of this game, but unfortunately, football is played over four quarters. <laughs> Their center work is looking a little bit better, but as soon as the Dogs got control of this game, the West Coast Eagles couldn't get anywhere near it. Credit to the dogs, they're looking like they're starting to churn again, their midfield's starting to work really well, but I don't know where to go with West Coast from here, they've lost their first three games by more than 50 points, I actually think they have decent players on every line now as well, I think they're just waiting to make the call on Adam Simpson when it makes sense financially, because... They actually play decent footy sometimes and then just get rolled over. I don't think it's just a personnel thing. I think it's definitely a game plan thing, a mentality thing. And the players just simply aren't playing for the coach for four quarters at this point. So whenever the time is right, I think Simpson will be sacked. And I reckon it'll be before round 10. Number eight. The Tigers coming of age game. I'm sat on the couch watching Richmond and they're bringing pressure. They're looking like the Tiger of old. They're absolutely playing out of their skin. But I start to think to myself, I can't name a player on the field for the Tigers just about. This is a completely new look Richmond team. And they went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Sydney who have been one of the best teams in the comp early on in the season. And got an absolutely massive win. Manzel, Campbell, Sonzi, Lafau. Who are these names? They've come out of nowhere and they're doing great things. I know Lafau only had like three kicks. But to kick two goals, he stood up and he'll need to stand up now that Tom Lynch is out for a prolonged period. Morris Rioli looked electric and it was just a great team performance all across the ground. So a massive win for Richmond. They're going to be hard to come by this year, especially with Tom Lynch out. That gives the Tigers some vital experience to be able to play for four quarters and bring the heat for four quarters. Adam Uze's first win as coach was massive and hopefully that can springboard Richmond into a few good wins to come. And number nine, we rode off Geelong again. So currently it's three quarter time and the Lightning has stopped the footy, but I've got to get this video out, and I think Geelong are going to cruise home to victory unless something drastic happens. Heading into 2024, a lot of people didn't rate Geelong's midfield, including myself, but Tanner Bruin and Jai Clark are looking great in there, the young lads. Max Holmes is probably Geelong's most important player for me. The run that he provides through the middle and off half back, it's absolutely vital in this modern game to get speed on the ball, and not many people do it better than him. He sort of reminds me of an Errol Golden type, but a slightly different role. Tom Hawkins doesn't look like he's slowed down. Jeremy Cameron still just banging in ridiculous goals. And their headband crew down back keep taking intercept marks. So we've probably gone too early on Geelong again. They're undefeated at this point, unless Marby Chol comes out and kicks eight goals in the last quarter. But Geelong will make the top eight again. Like, you just know they will. They're back. They're coached so well, so well drilled. New young fellas are stepping up. Dempsey up forward. Conway came in and looked good. It's just a classic season where you ride off Geelong and they're right back in the mix. So there we go. There's nine things that we learned from round three. But before you click off the video, it'd help immeasurably if you could just leave a like and subscribe if you're new. I appreciate it greatly. I'm heading off to Gather Round this week. So there will be content out on all of my platforms. So make sure you follow me on Instagram, TikTok, etc. Big round of footy coming up. Keep it locked to the Druzy channel and I'll see you in the next video. Until then, take care, you plonkers.